America. My name is Armio Yosef from Pong. I come to you live every Thursday about this time. And today we're going to talk about when history disappears. But first, while people come in, I'll just say a little few, a few words about NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Non-disclosure agreements. A non-disclosure agreement is a, a little piece of paper you sign that says you'll keep your yap shut about whatever institution um, you were just affiliated with. And often they emerge when you're on your way out. So a company wants to get rid of you or hire you, maybe. They'll have you sign a non-disclosure agreement and then write a little check, and then you'll just keep going on your way once you've been fired. So what's so bad about non-disclosure agreements? All right, so if you're talking about trade secrets, like secret sauces that are part of the intellectual property of the um, institution, a non-disclosure agreement kind of makes sense. Like I shouldn't... If I work for Colonel Sanders in Kentucky Fried Chicken and, you know, I shouldn't be able to know all of the ingredients. I mean, I shouldn't be. It's OK if KFC wants me to keep all of the ingredients um, or a Heinz 57. <laughs> Heinz 57 wants me to keep all 57 ingredients kind of uh, um, quiet. Right. They don't want me yapping around. That's their intellectual property. They built a brand off of it. That's fair. However, a lot of non-disclosure agreements aren't about trade secrets as much as don't tell anybody our dirty practices. Now, there's going to be a marked difference between don't tell anyone our dirty practices and don't tell anyone our intellectual property secrets. Some people say, well, our dirty practices and our intellectual property are kind of commingled, uh, to which I call BS. And if you think it's BS, then we should have an open process where we decide whether your dirty practices are trade secrets or are they actually just dirty practices, right? So non-disclosure agreements are a little bit dubious in general. I'm not a huge fan. And it's, uh, there are some things you shouldn't be able to auction off, right? So the public has a uh, public interest in the administration of justice. And if something unjust was happening in your institution, anyone who's going to be affiliated with that institution should have, like, access to know about what goes on in that institution insofar as the institution um, the institution uh, does business in the public right so we license the institution if there's something unjust going on we should have people should be able to announce it also we have free speech rights so it's both at the public administration of justice level and at the individual level you're bridging someone's um, um, uh, justice you're abridging someone's like individual right and you're abridging the public administration of all of our rights, right? So you jeopardize everyone's right when you normalize non-disclosure agreements in a way that's unbecoming. And there's some things you can't be able to sell away. Like you don't, we don't let you sell your passport. You can't sell your citizenship, sorry. We don't let you sell, um, we don't let people sell themselves into slavery anymore, right? There are some rights that you can't auction off. Uh, there are some things that we do let you sell, like some organs, yeah, which is a little bit dubious. But um, we don't, and I, I think I'm okay with not letting people auction off their free speech. And I think we need to take the public administration of justice very seriously. So now you know my little spiel about non-disclosure agreements. I was going to write a paper about the, on this about three years ago, but I kind of lost steam and started doing some other work. But I think they are dubious. Non-disclosure agreements, plea deals. Another dubious artifact that we've kind of normalized, again, for the public administration of justice, we need to have more people on trials. I, I mean, there are some horrifying stories about plea deals and people copping to things that they didn't do. Um, and we should just get rid of all of that and just fund the justice system adequate so you have enough judges and enough lawyers so everyone gets a trial. I have an interest to know what's going on. So these plea deals are, are dubious, and I'm sure people in chat have horrifying stories about um, what's done in the name of a plea deal. But, and these are all forms of what the, what the real topic for today is going to be is when history disappears. Because that's what you're disappearing with a non-disclosure agreement. And that's what you're disappearing with a plea deal. You don't want the investigation into history. You don't want to know what happened. You want to just keep that um, quiet. Right? But we're going to talk a little bit with more concrete terms about what happens when history disappears after I hit the opening. To the beach, oh. Oh, yeah. Sound good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state the facts. You leave it up to me, I'll paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. To the beach, oh. To the beach, oh. And 
I am back. We are talking about uh, what happens when history disappears. So why, do you, why is history important? It's not just you got to know it's important to remember where you came from for some antiquarian idea just because you like old things. No, because if you actually organize the stories you tell about yourself to make who you are disappear or confuse um, who people are in the present by, uh, by uh, being a little bit too clever with what happened in the past, then people get confused about how to sustain what they are. They don't know what they are. They don't know how to sustain it, and they definitely don't know how to reproduce it. You see this with, uh, on the micro level, you see this with children all the time, where they don't understand how their kids are kind of a degraded version of themselves. Not even themselves, just a degraded version of themselves. Your kid's a degraded version of, his, of yourself because you don't actually know how you became yourself. You didn't take that seriously. You've disappeared parts of your history, formative parts of your history that have made you who you are, and now you are surprised when you can't reproduce yourself. Um, and that's kind of a, a thing because we're not immediate creatures. We are historical. We were produced. And if you don't understand how you are reproduced, you're not going to understand how you are going to sustain or how you're going to reproduce in the next generation. All right? So um, you'll think it's all held by magic, and that's going to be low-key conservative. Because if, if you don't know how things, this is going to be Hume's argument, if you don't know how, what holds a state together, if you don't know how it holds together in, 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 to begin with, you're not going to go around messing with it. Because you're going to be scared that whatever you're doing is going to be the essential thing that's held it in place to begin with, right? So there's a lot at stake in not thinking that everything's held together, legitimized by magic, or just kind of emerged as given. But understanding where things came from, how they emerged, and how they can be sustained, and how if they can be justified, whether they can be justified, or if they can't be justified, how it's been the case that you have your entire life that depends on an institution that can't itself be justified. So that puts you in a pickle, right? But uh, sometimes history disappears. And I came up with this topic when I was thinking about a lecture I'm going to give on Monday to the class. It's going to be on Stephanie Jones Rogers' book, They Were Her Property. It's a book about white women slave owners in the American South. And it turns out white women were just as bad as white men. It's just that we don't talk about it that way. But it shouldn't be that hard to deal with if you've dealt with white people. It turns out that they are white people. Right, so the, uh, Stephanie Jones Rogers is a historian based out of Berkeley. Wrote a, a nice little book about how, um, you know, white women owners were just as bad as their men, and they depending, and you can't just, you can't just take their word for it by reading their diaries. You actually have to go to the slave women they they whipped and owned or sick their husbands on, and um, and you actually have to get the the other women's side of the story, right. Uh, the, the black women who work for these white women who will tell you that they're just as bad as their husbands, sometimes even worse and a little bit more petty. So um, what happens if we don't get the black women's side of the story? We don't know who we are. We don't know why we have the commitments we have. And we don't know what sustains the Southern way of life. Right? Uh, you think of Southern womanhood as being white womanhood where their biggest oppressor is their horrid husband. Not themselves being horrid themselves to everyone they can to uh, sustain their way of life. So you get a distorted notion of who you are because you don't know how the institutions you're interacting with are sustained because history has disappeared or you've disappeared it. Right? By the way, if you like anything I'm doing, go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com Kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars um, a month, and I'll just keep doing what I'm doing because I think I'm telling, giving you a quality of of education that the people need, right? And and right, and this is the historical record, right? So when somehow I stroke out or something happens, I get a heart attack. It will not be suicide. If you ever hear me dying of suspicious circumstances, because I I got I said something too hot right here on this microphone. It's not because I, uh, you know, I was feeling sad or anything like that. Suspicious circumstances means they rubbed me out. And by the way, if they do rub me out, I'm going to need you to take everything down. Take it down. And I'm not talking about, like, delete your account. I'm talking about I want fire. I want Molotov cocktails. Burn it down. Because I did not die by my own hands. I was taken out. And so I need you to just raise hell. 
All right. I do not forgive anybody. <laughs> not one bit. And don't let anybody say, he was a gentleman. He wouldn't want you to hurt. No, I want you to burn it down. Burn it down. Uh, if, I, if anything happens to me under su suspicious circumstances, I want retribution. <laughs> I want the sword. No doves. <laughs> um, and don't let them tell you anything. And like, uh, no. I want to be very clear about that. I expect payback. Django. Um, all right, so history, uh, if, when you forget how you've become or the institutions um, uh, uh, around, like through which you live your life, when you forget how they've emerged, then you don't know how to sustain them and you don't know how to reproduce them. You're just going on autopilot. And it's going to be a slow decay. Right? So that's the stake of, of, of letting history disappear or let it be one-sided or distorted because you just, you don't, a lot of people don't really know where they come to or like how they came to be who they are. They don't know how the institutions they worked with came to be who they are. And if you don't know how you've come to be what you are, you don't know how to sustain yourself and you don't know what can move and how to progress because you're scared to change anything because you don't know what keeps it um, uh, kicking to begin with, right? So, um, be very, be very wary. Be very wary of of people who don't take institutional memory seriously, and people who don't take history seriously, and who think that like you can just leave. Um, archives are very important, and we need to be a little bit more aggressive about our cultural archives. And I'm not just talking about word of mouth. I'm talking about uh, videos, anything. Like, all right, these stories are important because they make us who they are, and they tell us how we've become who we are. Right? I'd say I've told people before in a well ordered world, every 70 year old, once they hit 70, they get a knock on the door with a three person team um, that just puts a camera in front of their face and says, All right, tell us your side of the story. The 60s, what happened? The 70s, go. And you just do 15 minutes a decade. And then you come back the next week and do it again. And then we just upload that to the Library of Congress. And that's our, in a searchable database. And that's our cultural archive. Right? Because this book, They Were Her Property, only is available because of the WPA. That's the, the New Deal project, the New Deal um, program that sent people to talk to formerly enslaved people during the 30s, those who were still alive, and also like the, or those who were newly emancipated or had parents who were slaves, right? So um, you need to take seriously the idea that without that government program, because the market's not going to, you can't, it, can't it, it shouldn't be volunteer, and it shouldn't be, you know, those people who have access to the market um, metrics. It, it needs to be a government program as a matter of right. And not just for the individual who's saying their side, but for the public administration of our democracy, we need to know those stories, especially of the people who are on the bottom class. For the public administration of our democracy, I need a cultural archive of how, you know, working class black women, <laughs> their side of the story. Because, you know, working class white, I mean, upper class white women will always tell their side. They'll always have the memoirs. Memoirs. And they'll live forever, and so like they'll just keep telling their side. And it will never be the whole truth. It will be a truth that makes them look good. So um, I want the working, I want their maids, I want their gardeners, I want their side of the story. And that's good for just how we think about the public administration of America, right? The cultural archive. So it's not just about the person who's telling the story, it's about everyone who has an investment in the institutions as they are. Because if they don't know how they've come to be, they don't actually know what the institutions are. And if you think, if you just take the institutions as given and not as produced, then you're not going to sustain them. You don't even understand what you're doing. And you'll try to sustain them through means that are not appropriate. Right? You'll think they'll be able to be sustained. You won't actually get the meaning, right, of it because you'll try to sustain it through other means. And this is, uh, you know, I, say, I make this argument a lot when I talk about the difference between self-government and authoritarian government. They could always produce the same goods, but it'll be by different means. 
And if you don't understand how the means is part of the end, you'll just say, like, well, healthcare is healthcare. It doesn't matter if a, if a dictator is giving it to me or if it comes through a democratically um, uh, elected process. But there's actually going to be stake. There's actually going to be stakes um, to giving yourself over to one program as opposed to the other, even if the products seem to be the same. If the products seem to be the same. Right, so you need to know how things become so you don't just take them as given. And if you know how things become, you'll know how to sustain them and how to reproduce them. I'll say this again, right, because I said it at the beginning, but it's very important. A lot of people screw up with their kids because they don't know how they became who they became. And so they just think either by magic or the market, um, their kids will be reproduced. And, or they have a selective memory. They tell themselves stories about, stories about their own growing up. Uh, growing up that aren't exactly accurate, so they'll be surprised when their kids don't end up with the same outcomes, right? So we just need to be honest. We just need to be honest about who we are and where we came from in order to be able to sustain who we are and and uh, reproduce, you know, something better. And not by magic, but by actual purpose and intent, right? So this is hard. You have to intentionally, like, create cultural archives, and materially, this is easy, like write journals or whatever, do videos. Ideas is a little bit more tricky because if you have an idea, you could talk about the idea, you could write about the idea, and you can write about the struggle realizing the idea. Um, so there'll be a record for it. If you're still formulating the idea, the archaeology of an idea, where do ideas come from, that becomes really hard because the people who are actually forming the idea don't know that that's what they're doing because if they knew that that's what they were doing it wouldn't the idea would already be magic examples people who think that you know someone virtual insanity says uh, uh examples of people who try to think that they, they can reproduce their kids by magic yeah no, yeah it happens all the times liberals are the worst about it conservatives actually put a little bit more thought insta into institutional regards but liberals just think well i'm good so if I just let my kid try to do what they want to be happy, they'll be good. And then it turns out that it, like with drugs, right? So uh, they think, or like some sort of small degradation of, of like, or major degradation of where they're at. So they're setting their kids up to be downwardly mobile and they don't even know. This is, these are liberals, right? Or they'll just end up, when they run out of ideas and the market doesn't work, they'll end up like reaching back to some unthought conservative dogma and then end up sounding like their grandparents and being surprised, surprised when it works out that way. But it turns out that was always going to happen when you don't know um, how you became who you are. Right? So if you think institutions hold themselves by magic or you think kids raise themselves by magic or you think that by magic they'll just automatically become as successful as you are, you are naive to the point of dangerous. <laughs> naive to the point of dangerous. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, just be a free spirit. Look, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a whole show on this next week, but you have to actually teach your kids everything about all of their institutional relationships. It's not just about how to be a good citizen. You also have to teach them about how to, like, hold and sustain a job. Or you'll teach, them, and you have to also teach them about how to hold and sustain an intimate partnership, right? Preferably you can model all these things, but if you don't model these things, you can at least plan and teach them um, how to do all of these things because it won't happen by magic. And then you'll be surprised when your kids got like divorced and three kids or whatever because you never taught them what to look for in a partner. And you can say, well, I don't like making decisions for them. Well, th then you don't want to be a parent. Modern life is complicated, very, very, very complicated. And if you don't want to actually like offer that kind of guidance about like citizenship, guidance about the role of civilians in civil society as in jobs they should try to do, or guidance about like what they should look for in a partner, you're not actually serious about raising a functional human in this in these United States. Right? So you need to have many talks with your kids about all of these things if you don't want them to, if you don't think it happens by magic. Or you'll be surprised when you raise like someone with bad politics, someone with like <laughs> you know, impossible to, for them to sustain an income, and someone who like also can't sustain a relationship. 
if you think that luck or the market is going to teach them how to comport themselves in all of these spheres of duties. So people say that, like, you know, I should let kids be kids. Like, no, no, you need to teach them. They won't know how to do any of these things unless you teach them. Or they'll just think that they, they might have it magically. Like, my kids, when they become old enough to be parents themselves, they're going to know that they came from a very intentional parent. And they themselves are going to be very intentional with their children. And I think that's a good thing. But, um, also, I do this, and I'm very intentional with what I tell you so that you are more intentional with your life. <laughs> so you'll have a plan about like our politics, our civil society, and your kids, who my kids might end up dating. So I try to get all of this out to you to help you be a little bit more intentional about like you know, how we make ourselves, um, you know, free black people in these United States. Because make no mistake, if you don't do that, just know that other people uh, do have designs on you. <laughs> they have designs on how you, your citizenship. The Democratic Party's got a lot at stake in your citizenship. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, they have designs on where you fit into the workforce in civil society, and they have designs about how you should think about your um, intimate partners, right? So you need to be intentional in all of your kind of interactions to teach how, like, how you've come to what you've come to and why you've come to what you've come to and teach that history and, and make sure everyone knows that it doesn't happen by magic. You can't let history disappear. You can't let becoming disappear. Not for some like antiquarian concern because you just like old things, but no. Or not because you want to give some sort of hagiography, uh, like, like deification of some ancestor elder, no. But because you want to know where you are right now and how you've come to be where you are. Because black people, if we don't know the history right, we just end up blaming ourselves. Like this is the problem with anti-critical uh, th race theory. They don't want Americans as a people to know the truth about America because if Americans as a people don't know the truth about America, black people as individuals blame ourselves for our own degradation. When it turns out that like the nation was designed to exploit us. Right? So without history, you'll find yourself, but without history, white people will let themselves off the hook, which they all want to do. They love that. White people will let themselves off the hook and without history, black people will find themselves blaming themselves individually um, for things that really aren't their fault and they, they, they have a, a, for public problems, for public problems that are actually expressed through their own individual degradation. They'll blame themselves individually as opposed to blaming the public and the system, the institutions that we've uh, set up. So thank you for your time. There are lots of stakes when history disappears. You don't know how you've become. And there are also institutional mechanisms that have a vested interest in disappearing history. They have a vested interest in disappearing history. Because then they could tell you who to blame and why, because history, the, the historical record has disappeared. All right, so. What a thing is, you can't separate what a thing is from how it came to be that way. You, you can try, but uh, that's, that's going to be a problem. That doesn't mean that everything is justified by history. Things can be justified independently of how they came to be. American democracy isn't bad just because it emerged out of a colonial legacy and as a slave state. Democracy isn't bad just because of that. Right, but if you don't know how it emerged, then you'll find yourself thinking you can start a democracy in Afghanistan just by like air dropping ballot boxes and like hoping that like it just kind of magically takes <laughs> as opposed to the series of pre-modern and pre-democratic institutions that were already in place before 1777. All right, thank you for your time. I will see you next week when I'm gonna talk about uh, dependence and independence and how independence actually emerges out of structured dependence. But I'll get into the law and argument next week.
Peace. By the way, go to www.funkyacademy.com. Kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars. I'll actually put in. I think I still have the commercial here. All right. Peace. If you appreciate the work I do every week and you think that I should continue to do it because I'm giving you the quality of political knowledge and insight that will help you not squander your life and kind of rescue meaning from it, then go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars a month or make one enormous donations. I like the monthlies because it allows me to budget more and that'll help me, you know, with a marketing budget or getting better equipment that works all the time because a lot of, in a lot of ways, freedom means having equipment that works every time you turn it on. <laughs> and I want to be a free Negro. So, um, if you like what I do, go to funkyacademic.com and contribute. Thanks often comes in the form of cash and the site takes 